All right, welcome back to the program. Talk by Fashua, uh, the, uh, the CEO at Global Analytics is joining me right now. Dr. Fashua, good to have you on the program. How are you today? Thank you very much. Good to be here. Let's get started with uh, Liz Trust, uh, the new, mm. the, yes, the incoming prime minister, the new prime minister. Boris Johnson has, you know, given his farewell uh, speech, the 47-year-old mm. uh, woman, lady, would yes. so be the prime minister. Do you think she's the next iron lady? Well, it depends on how she... Uh, Bob, Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> she's the third <laughs> woman leader. Yes, it's yeah, very interesting, okay. you know, but it depends on how she uh, decides to play the game. You know that um, uh, you ladies are always very strong leaders anyway. Thank uh, you. I take that as a very really good compliment. Theresa May was also quite strong, strong you know. Yeah. No, it is really, yeah, because they are more usually more focused than all of that. Uh, but she's also coming at a very difficult time. Um, at a time when the world is looking at a global recession, uh, when the UK is seeing 10.1% inflation um, and so many other challenges, you know, uh, they have a fall in their workforce by about 1.2%. Um, the, the, the economy has shrunk by 0.1% in the last quarter. Um, you know, so, they, they, so she's coming at a very tough time, but the kind of reforms that she would need to take now, you know, it's going to be very daunting for her. Uh, well, I trust that she will give it a good trial, a good trial, and um, you know, uh, the UK also lost position to India. India became the fifth largest economy overtaking the U UK. Yeah, in fact, it know, did so lose that some days ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very. So UK is now number six. six. India is number five, and uh, it was not so much in the news, but I I I, I caught that, mm -hmm. and it's because of the fee is because of the sterling uh, the pound sterling exactly really. now the, the sterling the is, is almost at par yes. with the dollar. With the uh, dollar. Remember that um, you know pre World War Two, the sterling was the global um, currency uh, reserve currency. It was the cost of the pounding that the UK received in World War Two and having to borrow loads of money from um, the U.S. for the war effort. Uh, by 1944, 1945, when the Bretton Woods uh, meetings were taking place to create IMF and World Bank, uh, the Americans actually um, twisted Britain to, to devalue their currency by 60% in one day. And, you know, they, that was when we went into uh, the gold-backed, uh, you know, era where every currency benchmarked the dollar and the dollar benchmarked the gold at $3.70 or thereabouts, at $37 an ounce of gold. Uh, but uh, by 1971, they found out that the U.S. couldn't cope because there was so much money moving into the U.S. currency as a reserve currency out of the pound, you know, because the pound uh, used to be that currency uh, because the, the British Empire had... Um, so many colonies around the mm. world and were so powerful, you know. So that's it. At that level, I tell people, the kind of power play at that level, I mean, forget about countries like Nigeria. That, that's the ultimate power play mm. with currencies, for example. Now, you'd, all, you'd probably also say that the British have, they've, they've given it a good shot, really, even if the pound becomes to par with the dollar, remember, if we say that the value of a currency, as a lot of my people push here, that the value of a currency is solely dependent on the productivity of that country, you cannot compare U UK with the US in terms of productivity, in terms of sophistication, in terms of economic complexity, in terms of size. So if you were going to look at size and complexity and all of that alone, perhaps the pound should be like should five be pounds to one dollar. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I understand. I understand you know what analysis saying, yeah. now, and it's making sense. Yes. So, what other things really makes a currency stronger? Because I, I'm trying to see uh -huh. your analysis. I never thought it's about it. It's what I've this always way. said. You get my point. Yeah. You know? Equally, the pound, the British, the oh. British economy or the UK economy is not anywhere near the EU economy. It's not even near. The, it's not even as big as the German economy. Uh, you not to talk of the entire EU, but the pound is stronger than the, the EU, EU still. You know why? So is it not so just about the quality? There okay, well. poli is politics. Yes. Is there not? Is it not also the quality of the History. production? Not only you know, so the quality you know, of the know, production. Like I've always said, and that's the economic complexity you are talking mm -hmm. about. So economic complexity is only one, a very important one at that. 
you know, the, the quality of the production, the value add in what you produce. Mm -hmm. Now, if the United States is where a lot of the top end technology is produced, you know, the China can bring in the hardware, but the knowledge and the software mm -hmm. and co is coming from the US. And when you look at the production of, let's say, an iPhone, you realize that 60% of the value is at that software level, still in the US. You know what I'm saying? Uh, whereas the rest can be shared, you know, they get some coal time from Africa. Maybe you talk mm. about 0.5 percent of the of the of the chain of the right. value chain, but when you talk about the real software, it's coming from the U.S. You know, so so yeah, economic complexity is one of the things. You know, like I always said, in, in in economics, where we look at, we want to model things like that. We have to broaden out all the variables. So yes, economic complexity is one of it. Um, you know, the size of the economy is, is part of it. The number of goods and services you're producing is part of it. Your economic diversity, diversification is part of it. But also history is part of it. Politics is part of it. You know what I'm saying? And your ability, you know, like in the United States, United Kingdom and co, you won't see them um, openly, the government or maybe their central bank, openly managing their currency. No, they won't. You know, they, they, they know what they do back end. I mean, if you tr anybody should try it. Try and move against the dollar to try and, you know, devalue the dollar and see what happens to you. It's a life and death issue. So unlike what we do here, people come out, they run down the Naira, they do whatever they want. People are taking position against the Naira. It's a free for all in this country. I, I get so pained and, you know, I, I get, I, you know, I got through so much agony trying to say, look, you guys are doing yourselves. You don't do this in an economy. They say, oh, well, it's a free world, it's a free market. Throw it open to the free market, float the currency, uh, all sorts of things that we learn. And, uh, you know, it's just, there's, so there's a value to patriotism also and nationalism, which is part of that currency as well. So there's history, remember where they're coming from. I had to do a study in, a, in, the, in the history of currencies. I realized that in Japan was at par with the dollar, the dollar until yes. the mm. Second World, World War. War. Hiroshima yeah. and Nagasaki mm. happened to them, the yen fell to 600. Yeah. Now it's, of course, back to about mm. 108 and all of that, 110, it floats around that currency. So when you talk about, um, you know, devaluing a currency in order to expand, you know, encourage export, you know, it has to be done sensibly. So a Chinese uh, yuan is floating around seven to eight. The Americans don't want them to devalue that much, but it's because they know they have value added exports, ready-made export, FMCGs, fast moving co uh, consumer goods and so, to export to everywhere in the world, you know, and they need to get that out. The, the productivity level is so high per capita. They're just pushing things out and they need to find outlets for those things. So the Americans would say, no, why are you devaluing? That's what they call beggar thy neighbor, you know, in, um, in, in, in economics, meaning that when you devalue your currency in order to make your goods cheaper so that they are, your neighbor would not produce and buy what's your, that is called beggar thy neighbor. It's something that's very much established in economics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if we're talking about uh, least trust, um, I had to like, you know, for those that have been following perhaps the UK politics or even what's happening globally, you will see that she's had a very, a transition. See, she didn't just get there yeah. today. Uh, you know, environment secretary at the time mm -hmm. she was on there uh, in, uh, uh, I think Theresa May's government, I think she was a justice secretary, if I'm not mistaken, and she still uh, went on to become, I think, chief secretary on treasury about economic program, she is also f uh, foreign secretary now and all of that. Very key for me also is that, I think she was born in Oxford, she also went to Oxford University. Mm. She's mm. the third prime minister to have, you know, studied in Oxford. And what came to me is I that- have, I have actually taught quite a number of them at Oxford uh, Oxford people, people you know. Uh, you know, but, but the issue is so really about the transition to where she is today and, uh, uh, not just even that transition. It's about the quality. And I, I don't really want us to say to just the post because we know what's even happening in our university system mm. uh, right now. Exactly. <laughs> you, you can't even be proud to say you are from a Nigerian university no. because we are not among the top, uh, top 1,000. Yeah. You know, so uh, very unfortunate. So what does it really tell, tell you, especially about even the race between her and... Uh, her, um, Richie Sunak. Yes, yes. Well, I, I was Sunak. actually quite fascinated by Richie Sunak, you know, 
uh, being the first um, from an India Indian ancestry Asia. to get that far. In fact, to become the exchequer, you know, very, very interesting. Uh, that the exchequer is, is the Minister that's of That's like the Minister of Finance, finance. You know yeah, what that's I'm what saying. The exchequer. And it's a very powerful yeah. uh, position to hold, you know. Uh, probably maybe we will try the next time again. Um, it would be nice to see that transition, just like uh, we were able to get Obama in the U.S. as well. You know, and of course we had a Nigerian who was also uh, Kemi Badenoch, who was trying to run. So, like you rightly said, um, she's got a great pedigree. She's been there, done that. Uh, what it tells me is that that's that's a British patriot who has now become the. You no, know, now I, I keep talking about this. The concept of patriotism and nationalism sounds very archaic. Um, you know, people don't want to talk about it. It's like, what's that? You know, just let everything be run by globalism. But unfortunate. I think it's only countries in Africa, like ours, that's run by globalism. The rest are looking for people who actually believe in their country and making their country great. So the, where, what she's been through, I mean, that, for example, you, tr chances are that you'd hardly find the Prime Minister of Britain who didn't go to Eton College or Harrow or into Oxford or Cambridge. You'd hardly find them. Ivy League school. Ivy League, you know. So, so it's like, like, like a club, you know, that, that they have to, to be in in order to get to that level. Uh, perhaps to guarantee that they would actually look out for the European, uh, for the uh, British interest particularly. Uh, even Rishi Sunak, they were talking about, has a kind of pedigree in terms of his education. You know, so uh, I think we're seeing a, a British patriot who is going to do a lot of work. But the challenges in front of her at this particular time um, of great global shifts, you know, tectonic shifts, you know, in the global environment, especially precipitated by this COVID-19, which uh, was a never-before-seen kind of um, a scenario where there was a global shutdown. And in the UK, they are still suffering from it. Uh, I mean, of course, it was compounded by the Russian-Ukraine war and the energy crisis they are facing now. Uh, you know, in Europe, especially, and also in the United Kingdom. Uh, the, 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 what you see, there was, uh, you, there, there's also the problem with the Brexit. So with the Brexit, what happened was a lot of Europeans who came to work in the UK uh, left back, the Polish people, Hungarians, and so on, Bulgarians. Everybody went back to their country. So now one of the biggest issues they're facing in the UK, which is why you see them uh, giving some kind of uh, highly skilled Ascension. visas, You're as a lot of telling there people now. to come, come, but they want only your best people, people. Uh, is that even their own people don't want to work again. I mean, people are like, if during COVID they did not work, but they could get, and the government was forced mm. to pay money to people just to survive. If you don't, you're not working, but you're getting a check of 1,200 pounds, why work for 2,000 pounds and then get taxed, you know, 600 pounds or thereabouts and be left with 1,500 mm. or 400? You know, what's the point? What's mm. the difference? So you generally just wake up every day, have a good time, watch Netflix all day, go to the pub with your friends, have a good drink, you know, and all of that. And, and you get paid as well. So they're having problems, you know, look at Ethro. Israel has been having a great challenge. Emirates and Israel went into some big argument recently about, you know, what exactly, you know, there's so much uh, baggage missing and stock and all of that because they can't find baggage handlers, people who will do the job. They can't find baggage. Even the B8, uh, British Airways says to their, their pilots that on your off day, come and work as a cabin yeah. crew as well. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. So whereas a place like UAE and Emirates, they've moved on, you know, very positively embracing the future in spite of the COVID challenge and saying, look, we're never going to go back there. Uh, Europe was, was kind of sleeping, including the UK. Uh, even the same thing that happened, that's happening with Heathrow is happening in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. The same slackness, the same unreadiness when the world is trying to move on. So those are some of the challenges that Ms. Truss is going to have to face. Let's talk about some of the challenges which I can see here uh, on the board. Uh, we've tried to I'll put that together. That should be Bank of England. Uh, let's take a look at, of course, she'll be meeting the Queen later at Biomoral uh, Castle. Let's also have in mind that this is a lady that, is anti, that was anti-monarchist <laughs> at <laughs> the time. In fact, I think she actually said that the monarchy should be abolished. And mm. such an irony, she'll be meeting the Queen yeah, well. in, in a few hours. Mm. But that, that was done in her younger days. Mm. Liz Trust was also an anti-Brexiteer. She did not want the yeah. UK to leave mm. the EU, but after some days she did say, okay, guys, 
she yeah. changed her mind and mm. all of that. She became, you know, a, a Brexit campaigner. If we take a look at some of the things that the UK is, is being faced right now, labor unions, uh, strike, mm. uh, we're seeing that talk of a recession, inflation at over 10 percent, predicted to get to over 20 uh, percent. What else is there? Of course, ni rising energy and fuel prices. You mentioned it earlier, deteriorating uh, labor uh, market. She has also promised to cut taxes, uh, to grow the economy and some other things. I hope that before the end of today, we will get a clearer picture yeah. of this. Mm. So the challenges facing her, let's try to dissect it. And the big part of it also is the readiness of global leadership in mm. the sense that, okay, the readiness of being a leader and let's just oppose it to Nigeria. This is a leader now. She's been, you know, the tussles mm -hmm. that went on before um, while Boris Johnson, uh, you know, resigned and all of that. I'm, I'm sure she's going to come in today and say, these are, these are, she's going to give us like a blueprint of this is how yeah. she's going. Mm -hmm. But in Nigeria, I don't, I uh, don't well see that you know, really. we, uh, I well, don't see that. Uh, like this administration came in and started blaming the last time. And oh the blame yeah, game is still on tomorrow. Let me also remind but you. I, 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 let me I, also remind you that even, unfortunately, even the good luck Jonathan government kept blaming. I, I, and the moment I hear someone come into government and start blaming the guy before, you've lost the game. You've lost it. You know, because your problems are well cut out. You know, you should come with an agenda, like you rightly said, and just move on with it. Anybody that starts to shift blame and, you know, you, because you have executive power. Yeah. And with executive power, you can do and undo. Um, in the case of Lee Strauss, unfortunately, the UK economy is actually beginning to look like a, 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 a developing economy, uh, a developing economy in terms of the, the contradictions. When you reduce taxes, you know, let's say you even reduce, well, are you reducing personal income tax or company income tax or whichever one you reduce, then there's more money in the hands of people. Therefore, you may have more pressure on inflation. So there's this uh, dilemma of what do we do to get the economy going? If you're reducing taxes, you probably want uh, companies to be able to <coughs> recruit more people, employ more people so that to reduce unemployment and all of that. But then again, in trying to reduce um, unemployment, you have faced with a scenario where people really don't want to work. I mean, I've been in the UK, funny enough, for, for about, about three times in the last six months. And every time I get into the UK, there's a tube strike. So, and I don't know, why, I don't know why I'm coming here. It's as if I'm the one bringing the tube strike. Just two weeks ago, I was there. Tube strike again. And when there's a tube strike, everything shuts, shuts down. down. And people cannot go around uh, cheaply. So people just say, listen, what's the point? Let me just stay at home. And so they bought into this uh, idea of work from home as well, which I personally believe that you have to be careful about work from home. Because the, the work culture and the, um, the, 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 the dignity of labor that we talk about and the, you know, the grafting, what the British call grafting, you know, the ability to go out there, put in time at work, stay in an organization for three, four, five years, all of that has gone through the window. Now what we see with the millennials is a scenario where many people say, listen, I only work two times a day. I mean, two times a week, all right? If I'm, any job I'm taking, only two times or three times a week. For the other two days, I just want to relax. You haven't even done much work in your life. You want to relax. What, you know, like, uh, you know, so, so that's the challenge they're having. Even here in Nigeria, Nigeria we're having that problem. Yeah. Not to talk of there, where the, the, the millennials don't want to do all that long work, committing to an organization. And, but look, we, 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 as you run your show, Nancy, the, the chances are that if you're like me, who are also, I'm also an entrepreneur, I want to be able to get someone that good, that's good from outside, good attitude, you train them, and you want them to be with you for about five years at least. But when you're turning over people every six months, you, even your organization will suffer eventually. And that's some of the problem that they have in the UK now, especially now with the Brexit. Uh, with the Brexit, uh, she was anti-Brexit. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they can strike any deal with mm -hmm. Brexit. It's a final thing. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has to uh, go out there and, uh, and struggle with their, with their destinies, as it were. You know, but with Brexit, they don't have that latitude where the moment a British person is walking away, a, Brit a Polish person is coming in to take the job and all of that, you know. But it's a, it's a great struggle. I think that they will continue to expand uh, those skilled um, visas to bring in people from even Africa to, um, and elsewhere. To, to go. Remember also, I realize that Britain also suffers from a brain drain to America. 
In the academia, a lot of their professors end up in American universities. I mean, someone like Neil Ferguson, who's in Harvard, you know, one of the best historians in the world, among so many others. And, and not only in uh, academia, even in the movie industry, a lot of yes, their great yeah. uh, actors and actresses have US. ended up in America never to come back. Mm. So when you look at America and, and, and the UK, you There's just see that, look, the, you know, they understand that this is their big brother, mm. you know what I'm saying. And, and they have that affinity. However, these guys, when they play the game, they also remember what they've, the Americans remember what they suffered in the hands of British monarchy over time. And sometimes some of them who are extremists also want to take, continue to take their pound of flesh. Yeah. So it's an interesting scenario. We see how all of this plays out. Such an interesting scenario. Such an interesting analysis from you. Analysis of politics, economy, and history. Oh, yes. Everything so meshes. Much, yes. Everything meshes. Much of actually. history. Yeah. And I don't know where our own history is going to. No, we, <laughs> well, I, I said it's about our history. You know, yes. uh, we are so afraid of history in Nigeria. But the way around it is this. Whatever you know, okay, when we, we complain about the colonial powers that came here, they stole our history. But I tell people, with the time on our hands, how much of that current history, our current history, how much of that are we documenting? Mm. The history is not only the, the genealogy about, uh, you know, this one gave back to this one and gave back to that one. No, it's also everything that people put down in writing. And more often these days, you also have to digitize whatever you put down in writing. So our history is the, like this African Economic Congress. Mm. The documents you put together, for mm. example, is part of history. A hundred years from now, we probably Someone, all be gone. Yeah. Someone will say, oh, in so-so year, Nancy, Nancy Ilo yeah. and co, and you know, Nancy Naji did this and that and that. But the moment you digitize it, you have a better chance that that history will uh, continue to be. Mm. So we, 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 we can't run away from our history. And in fact, a big problem we have with our economics and our country Society, especially with our economics, is that somehow people try to remove history from economics. I and had an argument no, yeah, about with someone can, yesterday, really. I think a lecturer in LBS, uh, you, you know, who believed that economics is all about mathematics. I said, no, it's not all about mathematics. It's, uh, the, the reliance of mathematics is what has actually failed economics around the world, especially in countries like Nigeria. It is what precipitated the last global recession when the algorithms and the robots failed. Yeah. They had, were supposed to have stopped trading bonds, you know, during the subprime. They kept on trading because the algorithms were not put together to understand human nature. Now, so long as there's human beings involved, you have to understand behavioralism, you have to understand history, and all of that has to come into your economics, economics. as well. Let's talk about William Ruto. Ruto, so yeah, Dr. he calls William. himself the, the hustler. Yes, the hustler <laughs> versus the outsider. Oh, so yes. the hustler, mm. the hustler in chief now will become uh, Kenya's uh, president. I'm, 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 I'm happy because if you remember, you were at AEC in 2019. And in fact, um, you know, his senses, I still have his gifts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> indeed. Know? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Yes, I still have his gift, the, the lion, which, wow. which he gave, you know, at the AUC in 2019. If you come to my office, it's there. So, uh, you know, I, I really wished him well. And f fantastically, he's now become uh, the president-elect. But if you take a look at this, this deputy president, Uhuru Kenyatta, I don't want to go into the politics of all of that. Uh, but the things really confronting Dr. Ruto right now. Surging inflation in Kenya, oh ballooning yeah, well inflation. Would you call that surging at 8.3%? At 0.3? In fact, yeah, when, when I was when like, when Nigeria is our... When Nigeria is 20%, it was close we're, to 20%. We're 20%. 20 percent. Would you, I mean, look, when I looked That's at the fair. Kenya economy, I, saw, I was like, 8.3? Those guys seem to be doing things a lot better. better than we are. And in fact, I'm sure, look, I went to Kenya in 2013, even though Kenya is a police state. Kenya is a police state. And I keep saying, look, all of these problems we have with terrorism and coal, we don't have a choice but probably to become a police state. I couldn't take a picture That's on Jomo Kenyatta. My view, though. Yeah. You know, but I'm just saying that, look, we need to press our people into that security service. When we, we, we are not manning our, our country, you know, with so many unmanned spaces, people come and do anything they like. I couldn't take a picture on Jomo Kenyatta Avenue. Under two minutes, I was accosted by a policeman. So what are you doing? I'm just taking a picture. He insisted I deleted that picture because they also know where they're coming from. I mean, these guys had to fight a Mau Mau war before getting their independence. You know, when we just blew grammar and we had a very, some very nice guys called the nationalists, the awolos of this uh, war, the Azikiwis and co. And then we got the thing. So these guys came from a war background, all right? And they are running the economy. Look, 
Kenya is about 55 million people. There was yeah. a recent report that came out on out-of-school children. There's only 1.8 million ch children out of school in the whole of Kenya. Anyway, when Nigeria, if they say Nigeria is no, no, 55 Five, million yeah. here, yeah. 200 One, million yeah. here, four times, yeah. okay? So if you have 1.8 million multiplied by four, maybe you shouldn't be more than 8 mm -hmm. million in Nigeria, but we're 20 million. million. Why would that be? Look at their inflation at 8%. But the thing is that we don't even have the accurate look at data their, for out Look of at their, school They children. have a projected growth rate of 5% this year, okay? They've been growing at 4%, 4.7% until the COVID issue came on board, you know? So, and, and, and so, of course, we all, both of us are in the box that, you know, what we produce is basically uh, agricultural products. They send a lot of flowers out, they sell coffee and coal. But in terms of economic complexity, which you mentioned earlier, in terms of the quality of goods or the value out of goods, you know, when Nigeria is at 129th position out of 131 countries that have been surveyed, Kenya is at no, no, 100, 105. I was shocked. Now, of course, I used to worry about the inequality because, of course, in Kenya, you still have a few white Kenyans, yeah. British people who never left, and they are the ones controlling a major part of the economy, including agriculture and all of that. But I think that over time, some of these countries are, they, have, they seem to be thinking deeper than we are in Nigeria. You know, and, and I'm, I'm very much amazed. And I think that, of course, with a Ruto, it seems like an intellectual kind of person, agile, think, uh, you know, I believe. And in fact, the truth is that under Kenyatta, the economy moved from the 13th largest in Africa in 2013 to the sixth largest in Africa. So I, I was looking at that economy and I couldn't find where they were erring. You know, I could just see plus, plus, plus. Of course, big issues still with corruption Europe, yes, in the economy, a bit of crime and mm -hmm. all of that, you know, but hey, that's an economy. I was in Kenya in 2013. And in, in, uh, the first thing I wrote on Facebook then was, listen, I saw so many skyscrapers in Nairobi, more than any, all of the skyscrapers in Nigeria put together. In Nairobi alone, yes, you know, and well-maintained skyscrapers in Nairobi alone than the entire Nigeria put together, you know. And I think that the economy, I haven't been there since then, I think the economy has also been growing. Of course, a number of uh, companies like... Uh, uh, Google and Co. I think they have their, you know, uh, um, regional headquarters in Kenya. They, they seem to be more. If you take a look at that. Kenya, the other story that comes to my mind is the story of financial inclusion and what they've hmm. done. Hmm. The stories exactly. of Safaricom. Safaricom. And for many years ago, before Nigeria Mpesa. even drove, yes, and Pesa, mm. uh, you know, Safaricom and Pesa and all of that because we saw like the telcos leading financial inclusion which we've come back to now exactly the, the model i wish we were a little bit more humble in nigeria but we don't even need to go to europe to find the lessons that we need to learn i think the kenyans are less wasteful than nigerians i think the kenyans are less wasteful i think that government are a little bit more responsible than the nigerian government you know with the resources that they have I mean, they're not a crude oil economy. Yes, that's what I wanted to so say. No crude it's oil. It's not about just digging in the ground. And I mean, here we are. We've Tourism. Run, we've run into trouble with our, with our crude oil. Uh, about 4 million people go into Kenya every year on tourism alone. There's a, in, in that same Nairobi, we have one of the best safari parks. You mm. don't even have to go outside Nairobi in order to see those animals. To and see all the lions. Four million, five million people go into Kenya every day. And that is dollars they're spending, tourism dollars. You know, when you get to Europe, France, UK, you begin to see 70 million people going in every year in the Dubai, perhaps, you know, maybe 50 million in and out every year. But Kenya is one of the leading, perhaps the leading after maybe Egypt, you know, in Africa in terms of tourism. tourism. And in Nigeria, I'm sorry if we were truthful to ourselves. I'm not sure we have uh, 10,000 genuine tourists <laughs> coming into this country. I, don't, I, I, I can't say anything about the figures now because I'm not too uh, sure about you know, the figures for tourism. Some of the numbers, I, I, try, I try to check on, because like, I'm 10, doing 000. an article on that. You know, I, okay. I don't research a lot of these things. The numbers I'm seeing from Nigeria, I think it's, it's not very <laughs> accurate. They are talking of some millions. Where are the tourists in this country? Where yeah, you, you see, uh, if, you can, if you see the kind of advisory that get, goes out from the United mm. States and United Kingdom to their people, and for some reason, our government has not been able to do anything about this. It's very painful. We don't even hear from them. You know, this insecurity is also affecting the tourism sector that was Absolutely. just like uh, 
you know, has not even started crawling, just I, trying I to look I think that it, the reason why Kenya is a police state is because they had suffered some of those terrorisms in the past. But you could see that, look, <laughs> they put up the guards. So unfortunately, I was in a place called West, Westgate Mall, or what's it called, in that same 2013. Do you know that the same never take a picture thing? It just kept following me everywhere. I was outside Westgate Mall. I wanted to take a picture. The security men, they blocked me immediately. I said, which kind of place is this country? I, actually, I don't quite like Kenya. I prefer Uganda anyway. But then I got in the mall. But you I can't think, even, you cannot even, you cannot even buy a issue. shirt and wear it and tell your friend to take you a picture inside the mall, inside the shop. So I said, no, this is unacceptable. Lovely mall, Westgate. I said, I want to see the mall management. So they, told, they sent me there. I went there, complained and protested. Look, what kind of thing are you guys doing? Someone can take a picture. You have a beautiful mall here. And all the brands were there, H&M, many of the ones that you would never find in Nigeria. Mm. Max and Spencer. So, you know, unfortunately, that same mall was attacked by um, what they, uh, Shabab, I think mm. they said, uh, some months after I visited, you know. And I was shocked. I said, no, I don't see that, how that place should be attacked, except there was an insider, because that place was protected uh, like a fortress. So because of that, I don't quite like Kenya. I think it's too much of a police state. But look, I'd rather have that than have what we have in Nigeria, where the government has done a lot of things on infrastructure, but people cannot even go by road because of we're all afraid. And look at us today. So everybody is flying. The flights have moved up from 20,000 Naira in 2015 to 100,000 Naira in one way. How are we surviving? You just have that sinking feeling about the Nigerian economy, like everything is closing in on you. And you're wondering when you will be able to last, and when your finances will last. And for breath. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's, it's just, it's not, it's not a good thing at all. The economy is affected. The security is a problem. Corruption like never before. You know, we have a accountant general accused of stealing money. The one that left before him also deep down. How can we not find treasurers of Nigeria? That's the treasurer of Nigeria. When you can't find a treasurer that will not steal, you have a problem. Because that's the person who in whose hands we put all the monies of Nigeria. And then you hear that, you know, the guy that was there before stole money. This one, the alleged one that just stealing. Said, stole money. This one alleged the stealing. Act, still in court. Act, the one that acted for him recently stole money. Yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, and where are we taking this money to? So again, back to the issue of patriotism and nationalism. We want people who can love this country, and it's not a big deal. The okay. point is that, you know, stealing the country's money, hiding in different places. Look at countries like Kenya, and now overtaking us, you know. Um, you know, their GDP is still about $125, $150 billion. But for their economy, on a per capita basis, that's quite a lot. You now know what, what I'm saying? Now, let's also take a look at Ruto for just a few seconds, because I want us to end. We have like four minutes mm. or five to end the show. If we, take a, if we take a look at Ruto, he's been adjourned as a successful businessman even before uh, he became deputy president to, uh, he's still deputy president to Uhuru Kenyatta. Um, what does it also say, especially as we go into 2023 elections, the three front runners? In fact, it, my guest yesterday on the show, uh, Mr. Tajuddin Olayinka, the CEO of Wyoming Capital and Partners, said something that struck me yesterday and said the, f the three front runners that we have, Labour Party, P2B, Tinubu, Ahmed, uh, Bola Tinubu of uh, APC, the, the Atiku Abubak of PDP, are market people. And I didn't think about that. He said, these, if you take a look at them, the three people, the three... They are pro-market. Yes, they are pro-market. Right. And I was like, okay. Only, only, well, okay. only Tinubu that, 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 no, that he said a bit on the social capitalism But he said that the three of them are pro-market. Yeah, yeah, there's yes, nothing wrong with being yeah, pro-market. Pro market. Really. Now, where I'm going to yeah. really is that with all of this that we've discussed, how, what can we learn, especially as we get into the 2023 elections, and the preparedness of these candidates, even across board, not just but, about but, presidency. But again, uh, Nancy, you know? you know, ordinarily speaking, I hate to discuss a certain three front runners. Okay. When I listen to people like, you know, my friend in SDP, what's his name, Adebayo, and I'm hearing a lot more ideas from that guy, even though, we, so, we, so let's, let it not be that we are forgetting yeah, some of our best other people, people, you know, so let, we, we probably need to do, to broaden out a little bit and not give anybody a free ride. I, I, there's a certain person I support, but I will not give anybody a free ride. You have to explain what exactly you want to do. We have to understand what you want to do. Like you said, three of them are pro-market. There's nothing wrong with being pro-market because at the end of the day, markets are an essential for economic growth. 
However, over reliance on markets and the belief, erroneous belief in efficient markets and perfect markets is where the problem is for a developing economy. You have to understand that those 20 million children out of school, according to the new UNESCO report, are not going to be taken out of the road, you know, by the market. Just this morning, I was reading the newspaper, Edo State actually now is a leasing. Going forward, we will enforce that any child found on the road, or keen, or out of school, we will arrest that child and arrest the parent. Way to go. In some parts of Nigeria, especially in the north, where this is rampant, we need such a, a scenario. And in the Constitution, it is there that the parents of any such children will be arrested. So we need government efficiency and government reasonability, you know, and you know, in, to complement the market uh, as well. So the market will continue to work for those who can engage with the market, but a socially responsible re president government. Or, or government will understand that there are vulnerable people, vulnerable people in society who need to be taken care of as well. Yeah, that's the point where we are so there in be a Africa. Balance. There has to be a balance. Is that, is that what you they call this called mixed e economy? You call it that, you know, exactly. Call it that, you know, but the point, you know, we have to understand that we cannot ignore the fact that, look, the history, where are we coming from? So where we're coming from, here we were, we were sitting in our country, feeling ghetto fabulous, the white man came and said, hey, listen, you know, I'm smarter than you, and of course he defeated us. There were wars that were fought pre-colonialism. They had even been coming here and shipping people out by the millions in slavery. They were, they were, they were kind of ahead of us in terms of thinking and exposure. Uh, or perhaps it was the challenges that they had that forced them to be aggressive. Imagine sailing 6,000 kilometers into Africa, you know, loading people on ships to and shipping them to wherever, you there. know. And so, so, but so we, we were, at the end of the day, they imposed a new economic system on us, which is alien to us. So it's history. In imposing that economic system, which we have to, we have to grapple with whether we like it or not. That's where we are in this point today. If you look at the way the, the, the Western economies run, vis-a-vis -vis our Nigerian economies run, I'm writing an article as well on how much money has to pass through the pockets of a Nigerian uh, and vis -a -vis in order to live a good life, and vis-a-vis -vis what the same amount in the UK. So, I mean, the, the, you want to throw a birthday party now. I mean, in the UK, you can throw a party for three people. Uh, just you, your husband, and one of his friends, or two or three of his friends. In Nigeria... It ah, has become an industry. Exactly. Oh, the exactly. one-man industry. Exactly. The one-man industry. So, uh -oh. so that's it. So for your And you birthday, can't take that out because it's your, providing for jobs, your, too, exactly, for, for people. For your graduation, for your wedding. So the history part so, of it so, is so there. So imagine how much money. And then <laughs> when you want to build a house, you have to buy the land. You have to do the foundation and raise it and paint it and furnish it. Cash money. In those countries, it's not cash. Not like that. So you can see that they don't need, on a per capita basis and on a PPP basis, they need an infinitely less amount of money to live a good life than we need here. Now, in order for us to get that kind of money here, we are depriving other people. Meaning that for you to get that hundred million to build your house, the truth is, when you're looking for that cash, somebody else. We're depriving the government from having access to such money for mass housing. So you go to the UK, they have council houses where even if you are broke and are out of work, but you're a citizen, the council, the local government mm. council, will put you in that place and, you know, you don't have to pray yeah. anything for the next in number fact, of years. as we close, because we're closing now, I was watching like a documentary a few days ago inside, of, inside Dubai, the playground of the rich. Mm. I'm like, Dubai is such a good example. I oh don't yes. know. At least f for what it has done. That's the country of the future. And wow. I'm very, very and sad. Like, My next article what? is actually on our constant diplomatic rows with that country, okay. which has blown out, unfortunately. Dubai is the future. I mean, they have the museum of the future now. Um, when you go to that country, you get inspired. We need to mm. stop all these things we're doing. We messed up, really. We did mess up. In fact, our, con our government did not also step up on time until this thing became mm. a major issue. In fact, just like you said, very, ins very inspirational. My vision and uh, I think my dream yeah. as the leader, Amaktoum. In fact, when I was watching the documentary, I was like, how come Dubai did all of this I mean, in 50, 60 what years? What they're telling you is that the how power... How old am I now? The power of thought, Nancy. Dubai is powered at the level of thought. You think about it, it you gets can, done. It gets done. You know, I mean, look, I mean, that's a desert, you know. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, they gave Nigerians free ride. Everybody go inside. Okay. The nice thing, we started macheting ourselves on the road, forming armed robbery, you know, stealing things from... 
I was in Dubai recently. I, I wrote that, look, 50 people were held. And I knew one of them. The guy called me. And they were held. All of them were deported the next day yeah. and so on. And hundreds of our people have been deported. You buy mm -hmm. a ticket, 900,000 to travel to that country, only for you to realize there's something wrong with your visa and all of that stuff. So Dr. it's Tashra. very unfortunate what has happened. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We've been speaking with, uh, or I've been speaking with Dr. Tokba Fashua, who is the Chief Executive Officer at uh, Global Analytics. And we've been looking at global economic issues. So many lessons for us to learn. I'll see you all again tomorrow. Um, I am Nancy Najib. Be the best you can be and be that change that you want to see by now.